It is my great pleasure to be introducing our third keynote speaker, Professor Tomasz Basiuk. Uh, Professor Basiuk is one of the leading voices in queer studies today. His widely read exposures, American gay men life's writings in Stonewall, as well as his archaeologies of queer history, documented in many edited volumes, such as Queers in State Socialism Cru Cruising 1970s Poland, have been hugely influential for now two generations of queer scholars, especially here in Poland. Professor Basiuk is a founding co-editor of Interalia, a queer studies e-journal established in 2006. I mentioned this aspect of his work first because of its tremendous political importance, particularly now at the time when the language of gender discrimination is mobilized by the growing number of anti-democratic authoritarian regimes. But Professor Basiuk is more than a queer scholar. He is also a critical theorist. His research interests including contemporary American literature and life writing and contemporary art. He contributed immensely to the development of American studies internationally as the president of American Studies Network and locally in his roles of director of the American Studies Center and the president of the Polish Association for American Studies. He is now the director of the Institute of the Americas in Europe at the University of Warsaw. For me, Professor Tomasz Basiuk has always been an intellectual mentor. It's 20 years exactly um, I wouldn't be able to say this last year, since he supervised my BA thesis. And I wouldn't be a scholar I am today without what he taught me and his inspiration. The most interesting thing about great minds is not what they think about, but how they do it. And so let's allow Professor Bashuk to take us down his thinking path in cruising and method, notes on queer studies in a transnational context. Don't put the floor in. Thank you so much. This is incredibly kind, and I'm very, very happy to be speaking to uh, to you uh, today. Uh, thanks for uh, being here at this late hour. Um, so uh, my, cult, uh, my my talk is called Cruising and Method: Notes on Queer Studies in a Transnational Context, and it's based uh, in part on my recent work in a HERA-funded project called Cruising the Seventies: Unearthing Pre-HIV/AIDS Queer Sexual Culture, which is also called CRUSEV for short, and which focused on four European countries. Poland is one of them. Uh, the other three were Spain, Germany, and the UK. Uh, and the overall focus of this study was uh, to work on queer histories which do not follow from <clears throat> a narrative based on developments in the US, such as, for example, uh, the Stonewall and riots of 69 and uh, the aftermath of that. Uh, the research included the collection of a number of oral history interviews. And um, although the project was not deliberately about the US, it was not an Americanist project. American culture and literature did come up and these remarks are framed by a discussion of two classic American texts, uh, Henry James's The Beast in the Jungle uh, from 1903 and <clears throat> James Baldwin's Giovanni's Room from 1956. Uh, the latter uh, I will talk about in the context of my uh, research on Poland. Uh, before my involvement in the Cruz project, as Susan has kindly um, already said, uh, I worked on gay men's life writing in the US and I'll briefly revisit this body of texts because they influenced my approach in the later work. Uh, simply put, my goal today is to focus on spatiality <clears throat> in order to suggest some alternatives to the privilege of temporality in field defining debates and queer studies, uh, including a repeatedly articulated insistence on futurity and also with the very idea of a historical narrative. A major inspiration for this endeavor comes from Eve Kosowski Sedgwick. Uh, she's someone to whom I will turn more than once. Uh, with a nod to the Krusev project, I propose the term cruising as my governing metaphor. Uh, and here by cruising, I don't mean just the erotic practice of picking up strangers, of people gazing, a kind of erotic flannerism, which also entails posing for the gaze of others. Though of course, the word cruising denotes these things. Uh, at stake in using this term is an attempt to look beyond the temporal horizon suggested by queer utopias insofar as they posit, if not a substantive core, than a future-oriented perspective, uh, hailing the arrival of something more desirable than or ethically superior to what we know or can have in the present. I don't mean to speak as enemy of change. Rather, my point is that an orientation to the future, as for example, in Jose Esteban Munoz's remark that queerness is not yet here, uh, may not have the same appeal in each and every place. <clears throat> and this talk is divided into uh, uh, these parts. There are three parts. I'm going to share my screen just for a moment so you can see them. Um, and I'll do this two more times. Uh, 
so they're called cruising and impersonal intimacy, shame and witnessing, and then reading James uh, Baldwin's Giovanni's Room in State Socialist Poland. And so I'm moving on to the, the first part, cruising and impersonal intimacy. Um, <clears throat> Uh, not surprisingly, cruising as an erotic activity comes up in gay life writing. For example, John Reggie's Sexual Outlaw in 1977 chronicles in however a fictionalized way, a weekend of seeking men for anonymous sex. <clears throat> there are passages from cruising in Daniel Mendelssohn's memoir, The Elusive Embrace from 1999, in which the writer discuss discusses erotic pursuit and erotic posing as factors in the cultural formation of gay identity. Uh, Samuel R. Delaney, also in 1999, ruminates on cruising as a form of social interaction within urban space. This is in Times Square Red, Times Square Blue, and one could easily continue this list. Uh, images of cruising may also be traced in an earlier American literary classic in James's novella, The Beast and the Jungle, which has of course been read in queer context before, notably by uh, Eve Sedgwick. James's plot is well known. A man and a woman meet and they do not fall in love. And as Sedgwick once remarked, a man and a woman meeting and not falling in love is a powerful force in the world. And that observation is certainly true about the novella. John Marcher, <clears throat> who's visiting a country estate, uh, runs into Bay Bertram, who had, whom he had met before. A long lasting friendship and Susan seems always on the brink of becoming a romance, maybe even a marriage, but these possibilities never materialize. <clears throat> Yet Marcher and May keep seeing each other and on those occasions, they discuss a secret which Marcher had shared with me years ago, his deep-seated intuition that something exceptional is to happen to him. May becomes a witness to a sort of sounding board for his strangely inconclusive quest to learn what that thing might be. After May dies, uh, Marcher visits her tomb and wonders if he should have loved her, whether the thing which awaited him all along was the love which he should have felt for her. Offered in the manner of an afterthought, his belated recognition or perhaps misrecognition of the thing which awaited him, like the beast in the jungle, like a beast in the jungle, defies the reader's belief. Sedgwick gives substance to James's unnamed subject matter, the never disclosed secret, uh, by reading the novella as an allegory of homosexual panic. Johnson's ability to countenance the very possibility of his same-sex preference, his immediate intuitive and panicky fleeing from, from such uh, some self-confrontation illustrates the response to homosexuality born from the cultural complex epitomized in Oscar Wilde's uh, trials, which took place in 1895, at the time when James began to work on the novella and less than a decade before its publication. Alan Zinfield has argued that the trials had the effect of shifting the presumed meaning of Wilde's The Picture of Dorian Gray from an illustration of the terrible consequences of masturbation to an illustration of the terrible consequences of sodomy. And Sedgwick places James's novella in this historical context, the context of this moral panic, without contending that the fictional character Marcher is homosexual. And instead she suggests that he has internalized the growing nervousness around homosexuality, causing him to become variously, uh, sorry, vicariously invested in a no longer possible romance with May. Sedgwick's reading of the novella is similar to her early work on Gothic fictions, whose male characters embody a paranoid logic uh, of projection, and which she sum, sums up with the saying, it takes one to know one. Her reading also presages her later interest in what she calls non-paranoid reading, which would abandon the logic of projection, and which may be illustrated with her discussion of camp as functioning in the conditional mode. A camp sensibility does not claim that this or that performer, filmmaker, writer, etc., is gay, but instead prompts the reader and the viewer to consider the possibility, what if the performer, filmmaker, or writer too were gay? A camp reading is distinctly non-paranoid and Cedric's reading of the Marcher character is similarly non-paranoid, although the character is coded as a paranoiac. Building on Cedric's reading, I would invite you to revisit James's opening and closing scenes to suggest that they offer images of cruising, although James's language does not, of course, assert anything of the sort. These scenes are, however, undergirded with innuendo, which makes my reading them as scenes of cruising, at least I think somewhat likely. The novella opens with Marcher's impromptu visit to the country estate, as I've said, uh, during which he and others entertain themselves by observing objects of aesthetic interest, which have been placed on uh, or put on display. And I'm going to move to, uh, to the quote. <clears throat> 
so these were, uh, there were persons to be observed, singly or in couples, bending toward objects in out of the way corners with their hands on their knees and their heads nodding quite as with, an emphasis, with the emphasis of an excited sense of smell. When they were too, they either mingled their sounds of ecstasy or melted into silences of even deeper import so that there were aspects of the occasion that gave it for Marcher much the air of the look around, previous to a sale highly advertised, that excites or quenches, as may be, the dream of acquisition. The dream of acquisition at Weatherend would have been uh, would have to be wild indeed, and John Marshall found himself, among such suggestions, disconcerted almost equally by the presence of those who knew too much and by those who knew nothing. So the scene of the uh, look around, I'll just leave this on uh, for now. Uh, the scene of a look around, such as might precede an estate sale, is spiced up uh, with a sense of something excessive but unnamed. The onlooker's appreciation of the objects jars with a coarsely commercial but also implicitly sexual nature of their appreciation. Sounds of ecstasy are interspersed with silences of even deeper import from groups of two in out of the way corners as people respond with an excited sense of smell and harbor the excitable but also quenchable dream of acquisition. It is as if James had Hieronymus Bosch's garden of earthly delights in mind when offering this ecstatic opening, which intimates something uh, unbecoming, even orgiastic. <clears throat> the scene is offered as a cruising idol, and this effect is alluded to, but also tempered by the disconcerting to marcher observation um, about the ignorant and the cognoscenti who are present there, a point which plays directly into Sedgwick's reading of the so-called homosexual closet as an epistemological conundrum. A more somber image of cruising is offered uh, in the, uh, at the end of the story, set in a cemetery, the closing scene is Gothic rather than idyllic. Standing in front of May's tomb, Marcher is startled by a man, apparently another mourner, walking past him. <clears throat> John is said to have caught the, shake, the shock of the man's face. There was a kind of hunger in his look. The two men were for a minute directly confronted. Marshall knew at once, uh, sorry, Marshall knew him at once for one of the deeply stricken. Nothing lived but the deep ravage of the features that he showed. He showed them, that was the point. What Marshall was at all events conscious of was in the first place that the image of scarred passion presented to him was conscious too of something that profaned the air. And in the second that roused, startled, shocked, he was yet the next moment looking after it, after it as it went with envy. So a kind of hunger, which may, marks the man as one of the deeply stricken, suggests desperation. Much less amazed that the stranger is unafraid to put his feelings on display, to show his scarred passion and the deep ravage uh, of his features, leaving Marcher roused, startled, shocked, and consumed by envy to the point that he throws himself on May's grave, an imitation of the man's passion. And yet, despite this heteronormative resolution, what Marcher I quote, was at all events conscious of was in the first place that the image of Scott Passion presented to him was conscious too of something that profaned the air, end of quote. Meaning that he was aware of something implicit in the men's gaze as they looked at each other, suggesting a gothic redoubling indistinguishable from paranoid projection, a passing moment of recognition or misrecognition in which as Sedgwick put it in her comment on gothic fiction, it takes one uh, to know one. Uh, James's trajectory from the novella's opening idol to its gothic closing condenses Herman Melville's idyllic depiction of same-sex intimacy between Eshmael and Quiquag at the opening of Moby Dick, 1851, and his elusive somber view of it in Billy Bud Sailor, four years later. A trajectory reflecting the so-called invention of homosexuality in the second half of the 19th century and the moral panic which came with it. Leo Bersani, offers another reading of The Beast and the Jungle in a book called Intimacies in 2008, a book which he co-authored with the British psychoanalyst Adam Phillips. Bersani points out that the novella thematizes James's characteristic use of indicative pronouns and of the past perfect tense, which serves, especially in his late work, to all but eliminate the subject matter. The exchanges between March and May about what, whatever it is that fails to materialize in, in, in March's life thematize this rhetorical evasiveness. Bersani proposes that these exchanges should be read as an instance of analysis. That is a sustained conversation whose subject matter remains virtual, a conversation about things that might be. That's how he defines analysis. May is thus analyst, a lay analyst to be precise, to Marcher's analyzant as they meet 
on a regular basis to discuss whatever Mosher half expects to happen to him. Bersani's reading uh, forms part of his discussion of uh, Patrice Leconte's film Intimate Strangers from 2004. The film's female protagonist, Anna, mistakenly enters the offices of a tax analyst instead of those of a therapist she was, what she was supposed to see about her divorce. In consequence of this mistake, but also later, after the mistake has been discovered, Anna and the tax analyst continue to meet for the sake of conversation, which gets better uh, once the possibility of a romantic involvement between them is brushed aside. And Persani Ridis uh, reads Lacan's plot as illustrating the possibility of a popular democratic or lay analysis. I propose, it, I propose to call it peer-to-peer -peer analysis, meaning that two individuals can function as analyst and analyzer and even swap these roles. <clears throat> At one point, Anna sees a copy of James's The Beast in the Jungle in the tax analyst's office, and Bersani contends that Leconte puts it there because it too illustrates this possibility of a lay analytic relationship. As Bersani clarifies in his subsequent discussion of what he calls impersonal intimacy, the absence of a romantic involvement between partners in peer-to-peer -peer analysis does not necessarily mean the absence of sexual contact. Instead, it implies the absence of an ego-centered personal involvement epitomized, epitomized by a romantic investment. Keeping the relationship impersonal enables the therapeutic mechanism of transference as the analyst responds only to the analytic process itself. <clears throat> Impersonal intimacy allows the conversation partners or the sexual partners, as the case may be, to cast off their corseting social roles. The effect is not unlike what Georg Zimmel uh, discusses under the heading of sociability. Zimmel's prime example of sociability is flirting, a non-committal provisional relationship in which the participants are free to don social costumes different from the regular social selves. Such role playing may function as a laboratory of sorts, <clears throat> providing an opportunity for trying out new ways of relating to others. Bersani's and Philip's title, Intimacy, recalls another film, Patrice Charles' Intimacy from 2001, whose male and, and female protagonists have a purely sexual relationship in which they do not exchange words or information about their lives. The woman ends with this arrangement when the man begins to seek information about her, effectively stalking her. Charles and Lacan's films are like mirror reflections of one another, insofar as the former depicts impersonal anonymous sex with few words exchanged, and the latter a conversation between partners not otherwise engaged in any social relation. And I, I just want to say other filmmakers have explored similar ideas. For example, uh, in Andrew Hayes' Weekend from 2011, a young gay man is provoked to talk about his life to his one night stand, who records the account for an art project. And the intimacy between them is presented as conditioned on the unlikelihood of their ever becoming a couple. And so in conclusion for this part of my talk, uh, Krusik and sociability have quite a bit in common. They both involve what Bersani calls impersonal intimacy and that makes them akin to peer-to-peer -peer analysis. <clears throat> and I'm moving on to part two, which is called shame and witnessing. So in the logic of Delure, published in 2002, John Paul Rico focuses on the role of cruising in his curatorial practice. <clears throat> he describes the experience of waiting for a chance sexual partner to note that the space in which such waiting occurs and which Rico attempted to recreate in his exhibition becomes infused with an erotic charge. However, the desire it provokes is virtual in the sense that it has no specific object. I mean, it not even has an object uh, at all. Rico offers his remarks on cruising, and more specifically on cruising grounds, uh, in the context of an ongoing debate about the way in which identity should not matter for queer thinking and politics. <clears throat> that is a debate about how the queer position and the gay position, what the latter implies a politi politically oriented uh, sense of identity, uh, how they differ from each other. In this vein, uh, uh, Rico polemically engages Michael Warner's defense, defense of queer shame and the trouble with normal, which may be surprising because Warner is also arguing for a queer paradigm opposed to a politics of gay identity. Warner notes that queer shame and ways in which queer subjects have coped with this shame are an underappreciated resource that may easily be lost with the assimilative normalization that, for example, gay marriage promises. Indeed, Warner sees the political slogan of gay pride as direct denial of a specifically queer legacy linked to shame. Uh, Rico's retort to Warner is that replacing gay pride, with, gay pride with gay shame 
would not abolish the game of identity politics as queers would compete for who among us is the most shameful should Warner have his way. Rico's preferred solution is to empty the queer self of any specific content <clears throat> so that nothing at all would define it. This solution is similar to Lee Edelman's antisocial thesis formulated at approximately the time of Rico's writing, but relying on a very different set of conceptual tools. Uh, the crux of Edelman's thesis is that queers might be best off by choosing not to deflect the negativity projected onto them by the straight society, and instead they might find their freedom in the space created by this negative projection. And as is well known, Edelman's argument has provoked a range of polemical responses, for example, by Judith Butler, by Jack Halberstam, and by Jose Esteban Munoz, among others, because his position was seen as irreconcilable with any progressive political program. Now, the criticism directed at Edelman has not closed off the debate about negativity. It continues to resonate. For example, in the most recent of Interalia, the most recent issue of Interalia, which, which uh, uh, is the journal published out of Poland, the Queer Studies Journal, which uh, Zuza mentioned, uh, this issue includes an article by uh, an author, Luis Valle Jr., who asks whether a queer political community, community may be possible without a shared sense of identity to suggest that a sense of belonging together may emerge ad hoc in the face of shared discrimination or social inclusion, exclusion. But what about Rico's claim that queer shame could somehow become uh, moot? Let me address this question by briefly describing how my work on American gay men's life writing connected for me to the Crusoe project. My thinking about shame has been inspired by Sedgwick's reintroduction of Sylvan Tompkins' work on affects and also by her criticism <clears throat> in a well-known essay <clears throat> about the New York prefaces, Sedgwick posits that James did not shy away from confronting the shame of his failure as a playwright, but addressed it by revisiting his early fictions and pointing out his shortcomings as a young writer. Instead of disavowing his shame and continuing uh, uh, and the continuing rancor which it caused him, James became interested in it. Sedgwick refers to this gesture as shame performance. By bringing his shame into light in this way, James was able to tap the transformative energy stored up in this affective complex. James's gesture of becoming interested in his younger self and in his sense of shame is characteristic of a number of instances of life writing. Queer life writing in particular thematizes shame and reenacts James's strategy of becoming interested in it, yielding a potentially transform transformative effect for the writers and perhaps also for readers. Coming out stories, for example, typically focus on how shame affected the writers, especially when they were young. One thing that comes out, that, sorry, one thing that coming out stories can tell us is that shame can be an effective mechanism of social control. Shame threatens the subject with loss of face should the transgression be committed, a taboo violated, or a normative veil of silence lifted. It can paralyze, debilitate, and disrupt, disrupt one's sense of self. Taking her, cue, sorry, taking her cue from Tompkins' work on affects, Sedgwick explains that in a moment of shame, the self is singled out only to be threatened with disintegration, which makes shame simultaneously individuating and disindividuating. We're thus both made and unmade by shame. She further links this paradoxical property of shame to what she calls its contagiousness. Again, following Tompkins, she points out that people are likely to feel shame when confronted with the visible shame of others. In other words, if I see someone blush, I am likely to blush myself. In this way, shame can both promote and disrupt a sense of belonging together. How should such being together be understood? James's writerly gesture of becoming interested in his shame, a gesture repeated by many other writers, invites the participation of a witness. <clears throat> in the first place, this witness is virtual. It is the imagined reader. In the second place, the act of witnessing and the figure of a witness, preferably a friendly, interested witness, are regularly thematized in queer life writing. To illustrate such thematization, in Edmund White's autobiographical novel, The Farewell Symphony in 1997, the narrator's lover, Nate Fox, prompts a sexual play which relieves the narrator of a persistent sense of shame about his body and his sexuality. Strikingly, the narrator describes that shame as, I quote, something fundamental, end of quote. He realizes that he was feeling ashamed only when that shame has lifted, 
so much was it a part of him. In the scene, the lover's crucial role is to be an attentive witness, responding to the narrator confronting his sexual shame with interest and not turning away in disgust. The witness does not himself enact the transformation, but enables it in the manner of a catalyst, we might say, by opening up a virtual space in which that transformation can take place. The strategy of inviting or perhaps luring the reader to become a virtual witness may be illustrated by Andrew Tobias's The, List, the Best Little Boy in the World, published in 1973, uh, originally under a pseudonym and considered to be the first best-selling gay memoir in the US. The book is offered as a wager. The writer hopes and expects to win the reader's sympathy despite focusing on his homosexuality. His strategy is to open with mentions of shame experiences which do not concern his same-sex attraction. In the very first sentence, Tobias admits to a troubled relationship to uh, flatulence in his young age. He then offers an account of his similarly troubled relationship to masturbation. So this humorous overture is likely to win the reader's sympathy and it occurs prior to any mention of same-sex desire or of shame about being queer. This strategy relies on shame's contagiousness as Tobias addresses a virtual community of readers who had experienced shame, a community which potentially includes just about everyone, and then uses this shared sense of belonging to prompt readers to witness, hopefully with interest, his display of shame about being queer, as well as his queer desires. What I have been calling after Rico de Lure <clears throat> has the effect of at least partly erasing the specific identity of the queer subject as prone to shame because it simultaneously appeals to the unique and the universal. Bringing to mind Sedgwick's point that I quote, people are different from each other, end of quote. The, minor the minoritarian appeal is that there is no particular insurmountable difference separating the minority from everyone else. This seems true of positions described as assimilationist or liberal on the one hand and confrontational or radical on the other. Even the so-called antisocial position formulated by Edelman does not posit insurmountable difference except as a matter of the majority's arbitrary projection of its own negativity, its death drive, as Edelman calls it, onto the objected minority. In this sense, Rickles' disagreement with Water over the importance of queer shame may be moot. Warner's discussion of queer shame does not advocate the preservation of shame per se, but rather the cultivation of coping strategies. Such coping strategies will remain necessary for as long as the social shaming of queerness persists. Luring a witness into a relation of impersonal intimacy in which shame is put on display is one such strategy. Sedgwick calls this shame performance and insists on its transformative effect. What I would add to her argument is that this effect takes place in the presence of an actual or a virtual witness. And I'm uh, now going to move to my third and final part, which is called Reading James Baldwin's Giovanni's Room in State Socialist Poland. Poland under state socialism is a good example of a place in which shame functioned in the manner of a taboo without an outright prohibition, as the Polish criminal code did not penalize same-sex activity as such. And yet, there was widespread understanding that homosexuality is not just wrong, but that it ought not to be talked about. <clears throat> the Polish society has disciplined itself to condemn homosexuality and also to pretend it didn't exist. The absence of penalization removed the most immediate motivation for activism, in any case, independent activism of any kind was made difficult by the state socialist regime. Heteronormative sexual mores were bolstered by the Catholic Church and also by the Polish United Workers Party. Um, the police eyed homosexuals with suspicion, monitoring their activities at cruising grounds and elsewhere. All of this, of course, helped veil queerness in almost total silence. The effectiveness, the effectiveness of these shaming and silencing mechanisms is perhaps most dramatically visible in the much repeated life trajectory common to both homosexual women and men of marrying, the, uh, marrying an opposite sex partner and raising children simply because an alternative to this normative model was unimaginable. A number of such marriages eventually ended in divorce, typically after the children had grown up and post-1989 with greater visibility of same-sex attraction and relationships coming in the wake of the transition. 
On some occasions, as my colleagues and I in the Crucif project were conducting interviews with queer individuals, people of a certain age, because we wanted them to remember the 1970s as adults, hopefully, um, um, we were asking them to share details of their lives under state socialism. We became witnesses to their shame and to the ways that they had coped with it and were coping still with the difficult memories of shame. Of course, an interview is not analysis, but it did occasionally have the markings of what Bersani calls impersonal intimacy. Researchers and their interview partners were strangers, usually talking to each other, uh, usually meeting just once. Uh, and we assured our interlocutors that their stories would remain anonymous unless they should demand otherwise. So the Cruisive project had the word cruising in it, also for some other good reasons. In the first place, cruising was what looking for interview partners sometimes felt like. We were looking for people belonging to a demographic which did not readily respond to our open calls. Uh, hoping to expand the profile of interview partners beyond the people we could contact uh, through a senior LGBT organization and also find within our own uh, social networks. Um, one female colleague of mine set up a profile on a dating site used by gay men and described our project on that profile. In this way, she secured an interview with a retired working class gay man from a prov provincial town. <clears throat> Searching for archival sources was no less challenging. To illustrate the absence of penalization meant that court documents had never been indexed for homosexuality and we sometimes relied on serendipitous uh, scraps of information when searching for such records. In the second place, we were learning about the importance of cruising to early queer organizing. Based on our interviews, it seems that queer men growing up in the 1970s were more likely to talk about homosexuality with one another, with another person or persons uh, than was the case for people who were older, uh, uh, who had grown up earlier than in the 1970s and who were more likely to have limited themselves to furtive uh, sexual contacts. In other words, by the 70s, the silence Vedic homosexuality has already begun to lift as news of the sexual revolution penetrated the Iron Curtain, for example, via sex advice columns, and also because travel restrictions had been eased. Meeting sexual partners at cruising grounds, bars, public bathhouses, but also at parties in private homes, led to the establishing of social networks, which were soon to become crucial for activism. One way in which cruising and the socializing it engendered played a part in activism was that they enabled a circulation, the circulation of early gay some is that publications. The first such zine was started in the early 1980s by Andrzej Selerowicz, a recent emigre to Austria, who joined a local LGBT group in Vienna called Hosi, uh, and who regularly did, and who regularly returned to Poland on business. He was able to use his fairly extensive social network of Polish gay men to distribute the zine. His distributors in Poland were handed multiple copies and they forwarded those copies to subscribers in person or uh, using local post. post. Uh, some of the subscribers remained anonymous. Uh, they just had a postal address maybe, while others were known to the distributors and in some instances they were friends and sometimes lovers. We know about this because the distributors, as well as the zine's readers, regularly sent letters to the editor in Vienna, to Selerovic, and many of those letters are stored at the organization's archive. Uh, one letter, one of several from a man named Dariusz Prorok, an important early Polish gay activist, is concerned with James Baldwin's Giovanni's Room, which Selerovic had translated into Polish in the early 1980s. This translation was officially published only in the 1990s, but a decade earlier, Copies of it circulated among readers in a manner similar to the zine, to that of the zine. So Giovanni's room is narrated by David, a young white American man temporarily living in France, over the course of a single night during which David's Italian lover Giovanni is to be executed for murdering an older Frenchman who had mistreated him. David is wrapped with guilt <clears throat> because he has left Giovanni stranded having chosen to return to the States himself and thus possibly driving Giovanni to commit the violence, however indirectly. Meanwhile, David's attempt to return to his American girlfriend, Hella, did not pan out because Hella discovered his sexual shenanigans with another man, a sailor. Now, just before Prorok shares his impressions of the novel with Selerovich, he has just published in an official weekly an article about homosexuals, which is still considered to be Poland's first gay manifesto. 
its publication in November 1985 coincided with the nationwide police crackdown on homosexuals, an event which would eventually provoke more intense organizing. And so in his letter to Selerovich, Prorok tells about how much he appreciated Baldwin's novel, thanks Selerovich for his translation. And he also compares his younger self, as well as some despondent young men who had sent him letters, care of the weekly, to Baldwin's Giovanni, emphasizing their common vulnerability to homophobia. The comparison also prompts his vow, Prorok's vow, not to let himself be destroyed the way that Giovanni was destroyed. So in the end, this is what Prorok decides. While he would remain committed to local activism, gay activism for one more year, uh, he has already decided that he would leave Poland at the end of that period, not unlike Selerovich had done. Prorok indeed did leave the country the following year and apparently never returned. In his letter, he does not consider whether or not his planned emigration, which is a defection technically, should be compared to David's decision to run from Giovanni and from France. Now, the product does not address shame. It is clearly implied in a personal story uh, which he shares about his former lover, uh, whom he calls the love of his life, uh, and who has eventually started a family while seeking out male sexual, sexual partners on the sly. Uh, the man's caving in to the social pressure to marry and to have children is prime evidence for Prorok that the grip of heteronormativi heteronormativity in is, is inescapable so long as one remains in Poland. Now, Prorok finds Baldwin's novel, that's my reading of what he says about it, he finds Baldwin's novel simultaneously depressing and empowering. His reading alternates between his identification with Giovanni and with David, so one and the other, evidenced in recognition of his own vulnerability and in his determination to survive by leaving Poland. Strikingly, the moral conflict which engulfs David in the novel remains unacknowledged in, in Prorok's reading, in, in Prorok's letter. His moral stance, product's moral stance is difficult to interpret. The manifesto he had published and the activist ideas he shares with Selerovich position him as the opposite of escapist, even though in fact, many of his ideas went unrealized, whether because they were too bold for, him, for, for their time or because product's health was failing him when, when he was writing the letter. At the same time, the activism was his ticket to travel abroad. He was to attend an international LGBT conference in the West, a trip from which he would not return. The situation relatively common in which uh, LGBT activism was a ticket to emigrate from the Soviet controlled bloc is difficult to map onto a reading of Baldwin's novel because of the quite different sociopolitical contexts. Now, we move on to another example for a minute. Stelarovich's underground translation of Baldwin's Giovanni's Room plays a central role in a recent bestseller called Swimming in the Dark, published just last year. It's a novelistic debut by Tomasz Jędrowski, born of Polish parents in West Germany uh, in 1986, uh, who writes in English. And the novel is set in Poland and in the US in the early 80s, which means a few years before the author was born. Jędrowski repeatedly alludes to Baldwin's novel. <clears throat> His Protagonist Ludwig is a recent college graduate in Warsaw who gets hold of a contraband copy of the translation of a translation of Giovanni's room. It's presumably Sarovich's translation, and lends it to another young man named Janusz, who leads uh, at which this leads to their romance. <clears throat> uh, the two spent a part of their summer camping all alone in the woods, uh, as, Janusz is, as Janusz is reading uh, Baldwin's novel. In this idyllic, idyllic setting, a virtual space in which they are isolated from the society they normally inhabit, and in which they are immersed in the novel, as well as in each other's company, Ludwig notes that his shame about being queer has become, I quote, a mere memory, end of quote. <clears throat> but with the summer over, Janusz wants to pursue the love affair, uh, even though he also plans to marry Hania, the daughter of a high-ranking party official, uh, because being married, uh, and particularly marrying this well-connected woman uh, can make his life much easier. Ludwig is disgusted by the duplicity of this proposed arrangement and he sees no future for himself in Poland anyway, especially because his uh, doctoral project on Baldwin is rejected since he's not a party member and because the police who have learned of his homosexuality are trying to blackmail him into giving out the names of other homosexuals. 
faced with these adversities, Ludwig sees Hannah's father's, see, sorry, faced with these adversities, Ludwig seeks Hannah's father's help to obtain a passport and eventually he emigrates to the US. Much as in Prorok's reading of Baldwin's, Yadrowski's character seems suspended between identifying with Giovanni and identifying with David. Structurally, Ludwig is put in David's place because he is the first person narrator and the events are his retrospection, recalled after his defection. However, he sees himself as more vulnerable of the two men, uh, which makes him similar to, similar to Giovanni rather than David. And also it is his lover Janusz who is presented as the duplicitous one, making him similar to the hypocritical David. Janusz also chooses to marry Hania, much as David plans at one point to return to Hela. But then again, Janusz is the one who remains stuck in homophobic Poland, <clears throat> which makes him similar to Giovanni, the lover who was left behind. Prorok and Jodrowski both focus on the tragic sense of entrapment produced by living in an oppressively homophobic society, rather than on personal responsibility in the face of this fate. The lives they depict are tragic, but in the sense of being at the mercy of fate, less so in the moralizing sense of a mistake that should have been avoided, that could have been avoided. They accept that there is no good way out of the existential trap which they describe. Neither the decision to stay nor the decision to leave is necessarily better or worse than the other. For example, Prorok communicates both his activist ideas and his plan to defect to a man who has already done this and who was able to intensify his gay activism in Poland while no longer residing there. It was all convoluted beyond it would seem the possibility of achieving the kind of narrative clarity which Baldwin offers. On first sight, it would seem that products and Tidrowski's readings of Baldwin may be addressed with Munoz's concept of cruising utopia, which pertains to images, texts, performances that offer a glimpse of an alternative reality, one that will be socially or politically you know, beneficial compared to what we have, but whose comprehensive vision is unavailable. We can neither achieve this alternative nor properly imagine it. <clears throat> the difficulty with invoking Munoz in this way, however, is, not, is his not so tacit investment in futurity, in the idea of the future. Munoz inevitably thinks of cruising utopia as a glimpse of a better world to come. However, for Selerovich, for Prorok, and for Jadrowski's Ludwig, uh, space rather than time is the dominant dimension, <clears throat> as they live in a world defined, first of all, by the Iron Curtain. The historical temporalities which they inhabit, never simple or neatly linear, are inevitably determined by this spatial division. To put it differently, Munoz's insistence on a future horizon suggests that he thinks of cruising utopia as carrying a transformative, trans transformative potential or a performative potential in the sense that the performative intervenes by demarcating a time before and a time after the intervention which it enacts. The performative operates in the future anterior tense the future anterior tense. It is about what will have happened or what will have been. I have mentioned Sedgwick's use of the term performative in her work on shame, and now I would like to call on her less well-known but no less insightful critique of the tendency to privilege the performative with its implication of a transformation or a transition from the time before, the time before to a time after. I have in mind an essay titled Around the Performative, in which Sedgwick discusses performative sorry, peri-performative, peri-performative utterances, which she defines as referring to performatives or as occurring in the neighborhoods of a performative, but themselves not meeting the criteria for being a performative, uh, usually because the speaker uh, uttering this peri-performative utterance lacks the agency required to use a performative utterance in the particular context. Her examples include a runaway slave writing a letter to his master in a manner which alludes to the letter of manumission, which the slave, of course, has no power to issue on his own behalf, and a series of utterances by fictional female characters who are either forced into marriage or prevented from marrying and thus unable to utter or to undo the marital vows. A periperformative functions in a spatially defined relationship to the performative to which it alludes, but itself is not defined by the future anterior temporality which characterizes the performative. Sedgwick opens with a simple example to illustrate this point, a situation in which someone utters a dare, addressing it to someone. A dare implies a threat of humiliation to the person being addressed, uh, should they not comply, should they not do what 
is demanded. However, a third party witness to the dare may be in a position to diffuse such threat, if not exactly to undo the dare, for example, uh, they can suggest that the dare need not be taken in all seriousness. Such comment, such a comment from a witness to the dare is not a performative, but it is a very performative and its capacity is to intervene is lesser than that of a performative, but it is not nothing. Its logic is not the temporality of a time before and a time after, but a kind of sidestep. It is something Cedric points out that happens in the neighborhood of the performative. It happens in space rather, in the kind of temporality that is implied uh, in the notion of the performative. Uh, the distinction which I posit between Munoz's Cruzic Utopia and Sedgwick's very performative is that the former is focused on temporality, on futurity to be precise, and the latter on spatiality, that is on an intervention whose objective is not a comprehensive transition or a transformation, but a localized strategy for coping and sidestepping, like I said. Applying this distinction, uh, applying this distinction, Cronach's reading and Jadrowski's rewriting of Giovanni's room are in a perf what I would want to call a peri-performative relation to Baldwin's novel. Uh, they riff on Baldwin's articulation of the power of homophobia without enacting a conversion of this recognition into a central moral dilemma, as Baldwin does for his character David. There is no glimpse of a future in the readings, only the possibility of escaping into another space stays in another place, whereas Baldwin does offer a way forward by suggesting that David could have taken uh, the morally responsible way, could have taken responsibility for Giovanni. For all these products and Jandrowski readings are not <clears throat> apolitical. They simply do not include an investment in a world to come. Prorok is motivated by the impulse to help the vulnerable young man who wrote him letters care of the, care of the weekly uh, after his article was published. Ludwig, the first person narrator of Swimming in the Dark, is motivated by the sense that his existence would become unbearable if he stayed in Poland, but also by his protectiveness towards Janusz, uh, his lover, whose choices frighten and even disgust Ludwig, uh, but which he ultimately respects. Protecting others and respecting their choices, even when one disagrees with them, as well as taking action out of a sense that a situation has become unbearable, are imminently political. And yet, in these utterances, Sorry, and yet in these, in these instances, these political acts and motivations are not accompanied by an expectation of a future change. So in 2009, the same year that Munoz published Cruising Utopia, the then and there of queer theory, um, the French uh, thinker Georges Didier Huberman published a short book translated into English as Survival of the Fireflies, um, in which he me meditates upon the prospects for hope in an age of decline. Didier Huberman begins with a consideration of Pier Paolo Pasolini's 1975 essay, decrying an apocalyptic disappearance of fireflies as a signum temporis, a sign of the times, an event signifying for Pasolini the end of a grassroots communal culture overtaken and replaced by a corporate and status statist regime. The setting is on the other side of the Iron Curtain from state socialist Poland, but in some ways the threat to individual desires is the same as it is for the Polish readers of Baldwin's novel. For Pasolini, the fireflies, Luciole or Luciola as they're called in French, have yielded to have been extinguished by Luce, the floodlights, the light of Lucifer, as Didi Iberman says. In commenting on Pasolini, uh, Didi Iberman looks to Georgia Agamben's apocalyptic discussion of the now permanent state of exception and his apocastic mess messianism without, however, giving them much credence. One reason is that Didier Berman saw the fireflies himself when he was living in Rome, after Pasolini announced that they had disappeared. The fireflies uh, survived. They have not been extinguished. Rather, Didier Berman tells us, Pasolini was no longer looking for them, did not follow them where they went. I want to add where they went, cruising, driven by their particular desires. In the end, Didi Berman does not negate uh, that we may be living in an age of decline, but he insists that an age of decline may be rife with potentiality and creativity, the opposite of barren, much as Walter Benjamin thought of the Baroque. Abandoning Agamben, Didi Berman looks to Hart and Negri and the notion of the multitude as containing unknown potentialities for defying this seemingly undefeatable empire. Well, in conclusion, my opposing 
Munoz and Didi Berman is perhaps overstated. After all, one may choose to think of Munoz's glimpses of utopia, especially in light of his title, which starts with cruising, as Luciol, or not Lucha, as fireflies. <clears throat> but even though the word utopia originally denotes a virtual place, the difference between them lies in the marked preference for temporal metaphors in Munoz and for spatial metaphors in Didi Berman. My own modest conclusion is quite simply, that a transnational perspective must consider differences in space before focusing on narrative time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, that was wonderful. Now, the floor is open to questions, uh, which as in the last two days, I will read out and then you will see them published and Professor Bashir will answer them. It is a question in the chat. Yeah, in the chat, uh, yeah, I was going to say that. Yeah. Okay, there is. We have a first question uh, from Karsten Juncker. Thank you so much for this rich keynote. I have a question concerning Tomasz Jędrowski swimming in the dark, uh, 2020. The novel very much seems to place possibilities of queer life only outside of Poland. How does literature in this case occlude or even continue to erase what you unearthed in the Krusev project, namely queer realities in Poland in the 70s, 80s? What's your assessment of the novel as a literary text that limits imaginations of cruising and its political emancipatory potential? Thank you. Um, the, 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 I think the, uh, the, 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 the one thing that I didn't really address here because it just, uh, there just wasn't enough you know, space and time for, for, for all, all of that um, uh, is ways in which Jindrowski's novel uh, uh, it kind of tries to you know tell the story in a way that is readable to I think a kind of you know international reading audience, um, and um, and I think it's interesting actually that 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 given that he is doing this, which is perhaps inevitable. I mean, he has you know spent a little bit of time in Poland because he was working on this novel, but but he hasn't. This is really his personal experience necessarily, I don't think. Uh, so, um, uh, so, so he's, it's actually remarkable that, that, that some of the things that Prorog does in his reading of Baldwin, uh, that they remain um, kind of in place in Jandrowski's, uh, in Jandrowski's novel. Um, and so uh, the, 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 the thing that which specifically remains in place is, is this notion that, that there isn't a kind of, uh, forward-looking perspective. Uh, and this is something that, you know, if you talk to political scientists about uh, whether or not they expected any kind of uh, breakthrough in, uh, you know, in, in, in the 1980s in terms of the Iron Curtain and so on, um, that, that was, uh, you know, that was the, 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 the kind of, um, that was the consensus that, that there wasn't a sense that, 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 that the whole thing would just change so quickly or collapse. And, um, um, and so uh, Yadrowski is really good at communicating that sense, I think, in the, in the novel. Um, and at the same time, um, you know, he includes all kinds of things which are, uh, it's a bit unfair to compare Prorok and Yadrowski because of course Yadrowski is a whole novel, Prorok is just one short letter. But um, but 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 Jandrowski, I think, is 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 taking certain pains to uh, to include things like intersectionality in the novel. Uh, for instance, he um, he talks about uh, um, uh, how the two young men who are lovers, uh, how they come from different backgrounds. One of them, the one who emigrates, is comes from a kind of impoverished intelligentsia family. The other one comes from the working class and that's partly what drives him to you know marry this this well-connected woman um, and so uh, you, you have you have a, a, a level of complication there which is quite in a way quite contemporary in its in its sensibilities um, for me because I remember you know the the 1980s uh, uh, in Poland um, uh, one of the things that is difficult about Jandowski's novel is that he gets many of the details wrong so people suddenly you know pay in a restaurant with a credit card, for example, or things happen that are just uh, historically uh, impossible. Uh, but that's, you know, that's a minor complaint from someone who is older than Jandrowski, I suppose. Uh, yeah, thanks, thanks, Karsten. I'm not sure if I'm answering the question that you're asking, but I hope I am. Um, the next question, 
sorry, the chat just moved. The next question is from Miroslava Buchholz. Uh, thank you so much for this excellent lecture. As for James, um, first question, uh, what do you make of cruising in James's small boy and others, which begins as a biography of his ideal elder brother, William, and ends as an autobiography. The second volume, Notes of a Son of, and Brother, ends with the trauma of his beloved cousin, Minnie Temple's death, somewhat reminiscent of the ending of The Beast of the Jungle. This is the first question. Uh, and the second question, uh, James was all too familiar with the practice of public shaming by family members, also while working on his biography of William. And of course, letters received by a family member were never private. What do you think about James's attitude to Oscar Wilde? He was heard calling him an unclean beast. Wilde shamed James in the competition for the favor theater goers. Once again, thank you. Yeah, thank you so, so much for those questions. Um, I, I think I may have to uh, pass on some of what you're asking uh, because I'm just not really prepared to answer the question about, about uh, cruising. I mean, one of the things that I, I would like to say is that, uh, is that uh, there is a very rich uh, uh, you know, collection of essays from Sedgwick on James. Uh, they're not many, but, but they're very uh, they're long and interesting and, and kind of dense. And, and she has uh, ways of reading James, which uh, which suggests that uh, that this theme of uh, of um, you know queer sexuality kind of runs through a lot of what he had done, and uh, and so I would be very interested in in looking at at, at small boy and others and, and notes of son and brother to uh, kind of search for images of cruising or or for uh you know for for allusions to cruising, cruising but I, i'm afraid i cannot really competently comment on that right now um, um the second uh, point i think is a comment again thank you very much for that uh and uh well uh yes i'm not sure i can you know kind of speak for james uh in terms of how he felt or what he thought about oscar wilde but it seems to me fairly clear that he must have been Profoundly affected by you know by 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 the trial uh, and 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 the fact that he kind of sits down to start working on the beast in the jungle uh, at the time that the trial is taking place um, and then kind of leaves it um, and, and and returns to that uh, project um, that in itself I think is 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 meaningful and and so uh, I think I think that. You know, I think that that I mean, I, I imagine that James is in a sense writing um, from that experience of of what um, uh, of what Sedgwick calls homosexual panic. In other words, a kind of sense of moral panic, which which engulfs him too in some way. We, we know little about his sexuality, but 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 it was nothing. But but there is uh, but there is um, I think um, good reasons to. Uh, take seriously the idea that he had been thinking about those th those things. I, I, I think that seems very clear. Uh, I hope again that is enough of an answer. Thank you very much for, for those points and questions. Right. The next question is from uh, Krzysztof Rowinski. Thank you very much for this fascinating talk. D.T. Everman also talks in his book about abandoning the perspective of salvation in order to see that destruction such as that of the fireflies, is never complete, leaving ephemeral pockets of liberty. Can this be seen as a way to stay with uh, temporal metaphors, albeit restricted ones, and diversify our thinking about temporality that allows for non-teleological temporalities? That's a very good point. Yes, uh, Christoph, I, I completely agree with what you're saying. Uh, I don't, I mean, I, I think that for the sake of, you know, kind of rhetorical uh, um, effect, in part, I, I needed to, have a, an opposition uh, somewhere in this talk, and, and I, I decided that that sort of time and space would would, would do that, but uh, would do the trick. Uh, but but of course you're right. I mean, uh, the point really isn't to say you know time does not matter, um, although time can I think in various ways be or feel like it's frozen. I mean, when I mentioned. Uh, that there is no sense of futurity in uh, in, no, in in Poland in the 1980s, um, based on, on on the texts, but also based on my recollections. In fact, uh, um, I'm reminded of a conversation I had with a Cuban artist some three years ago. It was in Havana, and, um, and this man said something like this. He said, uh, "Living in Cuba is like living in a film still." <laughs> 
In other words, you are always in a single shot. Now there's a film, but the film doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't move. There's this sense of frozen time. Uh, um, frozen time as in, you know, uh, society spectacle almost. It's, it's, it's frozen time. And so, 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 uh, so, so, so that sense can be very real. But of course you're right that, uh, that the, the, the point really isn't that there, there is no time, but rather that, that there is no theological time or that there isn't um, a kind of movements toward, towards, you know, a kind of apocastasis or, or salvation or, or some kind of resolution that we could all, uh, you know, look forward to. That's, that's more what I'm saying. And in fact, I think Munoz is also, um, I'm, I'm, I'm abusing Munoz in a way, I think, in that, in that he doesn't necessarily uh, want to have this kind of salvational or, Theologically uh, defined temporality, um, but 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 this orientation towards futurity is something that I just thought was, um, you know, in a way very different from from what I was looking at when when working on the Crusoe project. Thank you. All right. Um, the next question comes from Paulina Ambrosio. Thank you so much for this engaging and theoretically rich talk. My question is about Witold Gombrowicz's versus Henry James's and Baldwin styles and their effective potential for channeling the queer community's affects. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, yeah, so, um, okay, so <laughs> this is, uh, uh, again, at the risk of, of uh, oversimplifying, uh, I, I suppose. Um, I guess I would say Gombrowicz is closer to James than he is to Baldwin. Uh, and the reason that I say this is, is uh, that there is this sense of, uh, you know, in James of, of, of not giving us the content, of not giving us the subject matter, of not taking us anywhere with, with what he's doing. And, um, and, and I think that's Kind of what Gombrowicz does in a very different tonality, of course. I mean, Gombrowicz is much more about humor and and and, and pastiche and so on. Um, but there is, uh, I think, there is that sense of um, of, um, um, of 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 a kind of uh, I don't know if, if deconstruction is the right word, maybe destruction even of uh, you know of, of the narrative patterns that you would expect. And I'm specifically thinking of. Um, uh, there's a very recent book in, in Polish studies by Błażej Warkocki, it's about three years old, uh, which is from Sedgwick and, uh, and Gombrowicz, and then specifically on, on, on Gombrowicz's first book, which is a collection of, of short stories. And uh, one way in which to read this book, I think, and this is partly what Warkocki points out, is that, um, uh, is that you can read it as, as a kind of uh, um, uh, uh, refusal of the of the of the genre of of autobiography or life writing or memoir or bildung. In other words, he you know he insists on immaturity. He insists on his kind of uh, attachment to the absence of form, even though that creates all kinds of issues and and a sense of of you know, of, of objection that, 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 that he's met with, in fact, you know, by, by, by critics when, when he publishes this in the 1930s. So, uh, so, so I think, that, uh, I think that, that there is a connection there. Uh, thanks again for, for this. With Baldwin, I think it's a bit less of a clear uh, analogy. Um, yeah, thanks. The next question comes from Agnieszka Graf. Uh, thank you so much, great lecture. Can the 1980s experience of queer immigration from Poland be usefully compared to what is going on today? Young LGBT people leaving because of the uh, Polish uh, uh, rightist government and the LGBT campaign. Uh, do these generations even cross paths in some sort of queer diaspora? Um, well, uh, sure. I mean, um, you know, one, one, one thing that uh, that is, this is something that is really kind of under research, I think it's, you know, it's the question of, of, of um, the extent to which people may have left Poland in the 1980s. And, and, and as many of us know, there is, you know, there's a very, sub, a very substantial number of people who left and, and, and it was fairly easy to, 
um, you know, to get um, uh, immigrant status or refugee status in the US, uh, especially after the imposition of martial law at the end of 1981. And uh, that's kind of, you know, Janusz's story, one would imagine. Uh, but, um, um, uh, but, there is, uh, but there isn't really um, much research, so far as I know, about, you know, the, the, the actual numbers uh, or, or the, uh, you know, histories of, of, of people who had chosen that path. We know about some people, but but it's not it's not something that is really kind of broadly uh, known. So so I suspect that there is an analogy. Uh, do these uh, diasporas ever cross paths? Um, uh, I think that they do. I mean, you know, uh, it's. Um, uh, um, it always takes, you know, an interest in the queer past, I guess, to seek out someone who, who someone like Selerovic, for instance, you know, he's very open to, to talking to people and, and he eventually became a writer himself uh, and, and, and has, you know, events in Poland and so on. Um, so he is certainly kind of reaching out to the younger generation uh, in this way, for example. Um, and and, um, and I think that, uh, I think that, um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I don't know if a kind of program or um, or a, a way in which this is, would be formalized or organized in any sense by anyone, uh, but it's um, certainly, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't, um, yeah. So, so I guess my answer has to be no in a way, but there isn't a, a lot of of cross pollination between the generations in that sense, probably. Um, but I think that the the the, the and one of the things that I found in the Krusev study, what I, I actually spoke mostly to people who were in Poland. I spoke to a few who either left Poland for a bit and came back, or people who lived in, uh, you know, who lived abroad. But um, also people who emigrated to Poland, by the way, in the 70s and 1980s, uh, but uh, who were not, you know, Polish born. Uh, but um, uh, but the, the um, yeah, the, the, there isn't there isn't um, a, a whole lot. Uh, that uh, that has been done on this. On the other hand, what I found was that once I got to be able to talk to those people, they actually did want to share their stories. And so I think there is uh, there is a kind of interest, uh, certainly from the older generation. I've I've also run across some um, you know some art project that uh, I can't remember the name of the artist right now who was interested in 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 in, in doing a show around um, some of the stories that we had collected in in the Krusev project and so on so a, a young man who's just you know interested in in in, in kind of uh, Arranging this history, we collaborated in the project with a very well-known Polish artist who is openly gay. His name is Karol Radziszewski, and one of the things Radziszewski does is to look at the queer past, and and he um, does this in part by uh, interviewing um, people on film uh, by uh, by presenting the the work that they had done. For example, you know, photographic documentation of cruising grounds and. Poland and that's what in Eastern Europe by Richard Kiesel and so on. There is some of that going on, I would say. Yeah. Sorry, it's a long-winded answer, but I, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so waiting for more questions uh, as everyone is processing, uh, I, I will use the chance to, to ask a question. Uh, my question will be very general because of course this is not my field. And uh, nevertheless, what I would like to ask you is about shame uh, on which you worked for a long time and you've explained very well uh, was the process of how shame involves and uh, um, uh, begins a certain kind of interaction and is also a tool for identification as well as for control and my question would be since you've been studying different moments in history, can you say something? Uh, or can you say something? You can. Uh, how has that been changing? Was there, has there been any change in a pattern? I'm thinking, for instance, in the context even of the conference that we're having now, that the uh, electronic forms of interaction are enforcing very different ways of how we are perceived. And so also, of course, how, how shame is used to regulate or deregulate certain things. So what would be your thoughts on that? When you say history, do you mean queer history specifically, or I mean, is this uh, both, both? Uh, but I mean, I mean queer, queer history specifically. 
Yeah, so, um, so one of the things, and I, I mentioned this briefly um, in, in the talk, uh, one of the things that, that, that became kind of clear to me uh, based on, on, on a number of interviews was the extent to which um, there was a kind of, uh, you know, growing discursive presence of the theme of homosexuality or queerness, we might say. Uh, I want to explain, by the way, that uh, I, I talked about homosexuality as though it, it were synonymous with queerness. And one reason in, in, in the Polish context, one reason for this is that in, in state socialist Poland, there was a lot of attention paid to transgender rights and to transsexuality. Um, and it was uh, not um, vilified in the way that homosexuality was. So there is also that distinction to keep in mind. Uh, and I just thought I should perhaps explain that. Um, uh, but, um, um, but there was um, a kind of clear shift. Um, where if you talk to people who, you know, who had their first sexual experience, same sex experiences, in the 50s uh, or in the 60s, and I'm thinking of men at this point, uh, those would be occasions where uh, no words were exchanged, uh, where someone would just run into someone, um, uh, often by a kind of coincidence, if, if those were very young people who just didn't know what the cruising grounds were or, or that they existed. Uh, and um, and that, that was the modus operandi. Um, by the 1970s, you begin to have people who are actually um, 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 able to find out that there is, for example, a, a, a public bathhouse. There were no gay saunas, but there is a public bathhouse where you know men who like to have sex with other men um, convene on a certain uh, you know weeknight or something, and so uh, so that information began to circulate. It wasn't always. Um, you know, sort of positive uh, affirmation of gay identity. I'm not suggesting that, but there was at least um, a, a sense that one could talk about it. So th that is a very clear shift, I think. And that is the way in which I mean, when I, that is what I mean when I say that, that cruising begins to kind of um, merge or morph into forms of activism or the social networks, which later become the basis for activist uh, networks. Uh, it's, a, it's a very striking moment, I think, and it happens so far as I can see at this point in the 1970s. But I'm talking about Poland, which is perhaps a little uh, uh, out of context here. No, no, we are virtually in Poland and, and yeah. There's, there's, I mean, there's certainly, you know, there's certainly, um, you know, work and shame that is done in the U.S. Um, and um, one of the things that uh, that make the situation quite different is this context of activism, which is which is uh, uh, which is kind of motivated by 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 by, by a wish to uh, resist. You know, penalization of of same sex same sex activities. I think this is this is one of the, this is one major difference. I mean, there are other differences, obviously, but but this is one major difference that there is a kind of political sense in which uh, in, in which it makes sense to fight in a very kind of immediate way in 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 a number of countries, not just the U.S., also in Germany, for example. Uh, uh, but uh, but 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 that doesn't exist in Poland because of the Napoleonic cult and its traditions. Poland just did not you know, penalize. Um, those activities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, there is a question from Markus Heide who says that uh, he missed the first part. Uh, thank you very much for the rich talk. I am currently back to doing some work on John Ritchie's City uh, of Night. I first read this in West Germany, mid late 80s. Was the novel available in Poland in the 80s? Have you done work on this novel in terms of cruising? Um, I no, I, I think it's a good idea to work on this novel in terms of cruising. And in the first part of my talk, I mentioned um, uh, John Ritchie's *The Sexual Outlaw* as an example of, uh, you know, writing on on cruising. Uh, uh, but uh, but no, it was not available. Uh, I don't think it. I'm not sure it has been translated to date even. Uh, but uh, but no, um, there, there there were few translations. I mean, Baldwin, for example, did exist, when I talked about, existed in translation into Polish officially, but not Giovanni's room until the 1990s. So there was there was relatively little that was kind of openly uh, tackling the, the topic of, 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 of homosexuality in, in the, 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 there was a number of works that were translated, but this was a kind of taboo and it was 
was a taboo in, in, in the literary field and the field of literary translation. One more question, if I may, uh, uh, since there are no questions at the moment. Um, you mentioned the project, uh, and uh, perhaps that is a very good occasion to talk about the differences, to ask you about the differences on how, uh, or the outcomes of the interviews in different countries. Uh, okay, so uh, I, I, should, I should have been more clear. Um, Poland was the one who was the Poland was the country where the interviews were being done. Okay, so so the project didn't always uh, involve interviews across the board. I mean, there were actually interviews that were conducted, for example, in the UK, but they were interviews with um, people who were activists or people who were writers, uh, and they um, were kind of uh, you know building on knowledge that had already existed uh, about what those people had been doing and, and so on and so forth. So for example, in, in the UK uh, in the 70s and 60s and 70s, there was a very important uh, role that was played by bookstores in the early queer organizing. And so uh, one of the things that my colleagues in the UK were doing was was trying to find out more about how that, uh, how that uh, um, um, you know, played out in, in, in the UK context. The difference between what they were doing in the UK and what we were doing in Poland, one difference was that we were uh, um, we were uh, um, um, faced with a kind of uh, absence of a narrative to begin with. Uh, there isn't like a real history, you know, of Polish homosexuality that 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 that, that, that exists in, in a book or or a series of books. Uh, uh, um, we, we were faced with um, with uh, some significant difficulty in accessing archival materials and also uh, with the difficulty of the absence of, of a kind of narrative that we could be uh, uh, basing this on. So one of the things that we did was we looked at other people's oral history interviews that had been conducted for other projects. There were several other projects which happened before or at around the same time that we were doing ours. And, um, um, and we used those interviews, but we also conducted our own. Uh, and the, 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 the underlying motivation for this was, we needed to have some sense of what it felt like, of what people were doing and so on and so forth. So uh, one of the things that we were finding out about, for example, was the differences in which, uh, the differences between the genders, right? I mean, the way that men were meeting men and the way that women were meeting women, but there was really no compatible sort of uh, institution of cruising grounds for women. And so the, the protocols were quite different and so on. So th that's the kind of thing, it's a very basic kind of research in a way uh, where we were, Trying to you know figure out what it is that people were actually doing and, and how they lived and and how they met each other and, and what happened when they did and so on. Thank you very much. Thank you. I see no further questions. Um, and I don't want to monopolize this. Um, Thank you, that was wonderful. And I think everyone enjoyed it. And the room was packed, and it's the last day of the conference and the last event. So thank you very much. And I think we can now move on to the closing remarks, unless you want to add something. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm good. Thanks very much again. And I'm just going to disappear for now. Okay, thank you. <laughs>